Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Tortuga Logic with Anders Nordstrom. I'm going to talk today about how to protect hardware against a specific weakness or threat. Anders, when you think about semiconductors, in the past nobody really thought that they were hackable because it was so much easier to hack the software. That's changed. And what do we have to do now? What do we have to think about that we didn't have to think about before? Changed. What's changed is that, is that you can now hack hardware remotely. Before, you had to basically have the chip in your lab and you could uh, work on one chip at a time. Now, you could log into a system across the world and attack it and attack the hardware. So we need to think about what are the vulnerabilities uh, erasing from that and how we can protect ourselves against that. So let's take a closer look at what really happens at, when somebody hacks the hardware. Sure. Anders, what are we looking at here? We're going to be looking at a specific hardware weakness called CWE 1233. And it says improper hardware lock protection for security sensitive control. So we're going to see what does that mean and look at a specific example of that. And CWE stands for common weakness enumeration, right? And there's hundreds of these or thousands of them? Yeah, there are about 100 of them that are relevant to hardware. And they are grouped so that you could, you could easily identify what's applicable to your system. How new is that database of those weaknesses? The software version of the weakness database has been around since about 2006. But the hardware weakness version was uh, introduced in 2020. So how does this work? What are you trying to show here? So let's look at a specific example here. Here we have a simple um, SSC, and uh, it's got the hardware root of trust, the CPU, some control status registers, and an AXI interconnect. So the first step we'll do is look at what are our assets in the system. And by assets, I mean, it means critical, critical data or control of the, the device that can change the behavior. So in this case, we, we can look at, for example, there is a true random number generator and there are control and status registers. So we're going to look at the control and status registers because uh, they are assets because if somebody could change them, it's going to change the behavior of the system. Is that a common vector of attack? Yes, uh, changing, uh, changing registers or changing memory content is an effective way of uh, doing an attack because you could remove protections or you could insert your own data or you could effectively shut down the chip. So what's the goal here? Are you trying to completely stop that or are you trying to deal with it as it comes in? In this example, we want to first identify the problem and then we can look at mitigations and then we want to make sure that the mitigations is effective. What exactly are you trying to protect here? I'm trying to protect the configuration and status registers. I want to make sure that uh, they can't be modified after uh, boot, specifically by user software running on the CPU. So you've identified your assets. What are you trying to do with that? Okay, so we have the assets, which is down here, the CSR. And what I want to protect is that software running on the CPU can't modify the CSR after boot. So if right here should not happen. And the way we are protecting against that is that during secure boot, the hardware root of trust executes boot code and sets up the CSR to correct values. And then it sets a lock bit. And this lock bit should then prevent any, any modification of the CSR. And that, of course, works if, if this is done correctly. And that, of course, needs to be verified. Otherwise, we don't know if our protection mechanism is working. How do you verify that what you're doing is actually what you're trying to do? So you could, uh, of course, you could run a simulation and try to do an access. But that doesn't necessarily by itself prove if, if you can do it or not. So one way of doing it is using uh, Radix rules and include them in the simulation. A Radix rule expresses a behavior that is not allowed. So How do you verify that you, what, you, what you're trying to do is actually what happens? So you're going to be doing functional verification of your, uh, of your device. But it's very hard to simulate that and show that something 
did not happen. You need additional tools to do that. One way of doing that is using uh, radix rules and then include them in your simulation. And radix rules express behaviors that are not allowed to happen. So in this example, we are concerned that the CPU should not be able to modify the, the CSRs. So we can write a rule that says this like data from the CPU, when this lock bit here is set, then information from the CPU should not flow to the CSR. And if, if that was attempted in, um, in your verification suite, the rule would flag uh, that violation. So you can debug it and correct it. And then when it's no longer violated, you now have a metric saying that this is what I verified and there are no violations. So it helps in, uh, in understanding what has been verified from a security point of view. Verification has shifted pretty far left to the point where a lot of this is happening well before silicon. Where does this fit in, particularly when you have a vulnerability that shows up potentially years later? This is done during the RTL verification uh, process. As soon as you have any RTL, you could start uh, analyzing these uh, illegal behaviors and you can go all the way up to, to tape out. So it's done well before you have uh, committed to silicon because then it's too late to fix it anyway. Typically, there's as much information as you can get out of the field you want to bring back into the design chain for future chips as well as to understand what really went wrong so you can prevent this in the future. Is that happening here? Yes, uh, if, you, uh, if you have a problem in the field, you can model that with a radix rule and run it in simulation. And if you see that behavior in, uh, in your RTL, you know, this is the problem I have, I can fix it. And then run the, the rule again to verify that your fix worked. And now you know that the, the problem you identified in the field will not be there in the next version. Anders Nordstrom, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you.